Welcome to Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. I am your host, Lori McGraw. I have spent the past 30 years in leadership, and over the years, I've come to learn one thing. Women need women, and not just any women, but inspiring women. Tune in every week to hear from women at the pinnacle of their careers and from others who are just starting out. Episodes can be found at inspiringwomen.show or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will be inspired. I am looking forward to speaking with Denise Brousseau this morning on Inspiring Women. Denise is the CEO and creator of Thought Leadership Lab, which is an organization that works with people and companies to develop their strategies as well as their leadership. Denise is a keynote speaker. She is a thought leadership strategist an author and an executive coach. Now, Denise has been at Thought Leadership Lab for over 25 years, starting out in um, other commercial businesses. She has been working specifically and is committed to developing women leaders over many years through both her form, her company, as well as other types of organizations like being a top 100 women of influence in Silicon Valley. She's been recognized as a champion of change by the White House. And she was also received a Forever Green Award by the Girl Scouts. Now, Denise is a Wesley graduate. She has a Stanford MBA. She has a long list of organizations where she is a board member. And Denise, I am really pleased to be speaking to you today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Well, let's get going. I mean, you have been in this space of helping and fostering women leaders for quite some time. So I consider you to be an expert. I'm looking forward to learning from you. But why don't we just get started with what are you doing right now? Tell us a little bit about Thought Leadership Lab. Yeah, it's uh, been such a wonderful journey, Lori. I I started this organization about 10, 11 years ago with a focus initially thinking that I was going to be helping women leaders with their careers, really career advancement. But pretty quickly, I ended up doubling down on a particular area of expertise in thought leadership. Uh, And it really all began from a conversation with one of your previous guests, Vaughn Tim Quinlivan. Uh, Vaughn and I had known each other for a while and uh, she called me up one day and she said, hey, Denise, you know how you were that thought leader in women's entrepreneurship. Uh, I want to I want to do that, too. And our work together, uh, taking her from being someone very practically invisible in her field uh, to being a recognized expert and then a thought leader and, and honored in a number of ways and head headed by the governor. You know, that journey of working with her on that strategy and that plan helped me to understand that my my own background as what I call an accidental thought thought leader and my own uh, real interest in helping women leaders could kind of combine into a organization that's just really focused primarily on helping women build their voices, build their followership, take big ideas out into the world and advance in their careers. Well, not, not just doing that, but being recognized for it at a pretty significant level, a White House champion of change. And first of all, what is that? What is that award? I mean, that's that's amazing. And how did you get to that level of being recognized as that champion of change? The Champion of Change Award was actually instituted under the Obama administration, and it was a series of communities that they recognized across the United States in a variety of different arenas. And so they would bring together people who were doing sort of very uh, prominent work, important work in these different arenas, whether it be uh, workforce development, in my case, entrepreneurship for women, lots of different areas of expertise, manufacturing, et cetera. And they would bring forward these these honorees uh, to come to the White House, which of course is quite a treat. Exciting. Right. You know, when do you get invited to the White House to get honored? Right. And that was super fun. But even better was that in addition to this sort of honoring ceremony, there was then a full day of get togethers with these other people who shared your interest and expertise. And so just really great roundtable sessions and and sort of going from room to room and different configurations of talking with people across the United States who are working on uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship for women. 
women and having a chance to collaborate and learn from one another. That to me is really, in addition to getting great pictures and uh, having a chance to be an honoree at the White House, to really get to, to hang with people who taught me a great deal and who I got to share my learnings with. Well, also one of those opportunities where you really had, where you really took advantage of, I mean, that's networking at an extreme level and um, sounds, sounds incredible, just sounds absolutely incredible. Denise, you, in your career trajectory, what you're doing now and sort of, you know, the journey to get there, you started off in what I would consider more traditional kinds of um, roles. So you've got your Stanford MBA, you're doing product management, you're working with more brand name types of commercial companies, and then it's seems that you went on to found your own businesses, be more of an entrepreneur. And I think today, most people sort of know what entrepreneurship really is all about. But 20 years ago, that really wasn't the case, at least in my experience. So how did you make that pivot? How did you move to more, you know, being a founder, being a, I'm going to create my own business when I believe that wasn't sort of the experience of most women at that time? No, not at all. And, uh, you know, I, I think about my first, I started my first company when I was 26. And I really, again, sort of fell into it. This was because I had worked for a, a crazy startup. And at the startup, I had gotten a Macintosh computer on my desk, and I fell in love with this little machine. And I started learning everything, everything, everything I could about it. And the company crashed about a year later and everybody in the company knew me as this I guess I would call myself a Mac groupie and uh, <laughs> I had been teaching Mac classes during lunch and after work like I wanted everyone to try this cool new machine and I went to another company I went to a software company following that and kept getting all these calls from people saying hey my company's you know starting to buy Macs and, and we need some help and can you come set up our network and can you tell us to what to buy and can you teach us how to use it and so so I started this little business on the side, in addition to being a product manager, and that, honestly, I made more money doing that than I did in my product <laughs> management job, and I just did it because people called me, and I, I think that the thing for many of us who sort of become these entrepreneurs, the best way to be an entrepreneur is to, to found a company on something that people already think you are the go-to person for, because you know, you're not trying to make a market, you're just following the market. And that's been my experience. And, and then I started out of business school, I started a, the first trade association for women entrepreneurs um, with some friends out of Stanford. And that again, was because so many of the people that we were hearing from, my friend and I who started this, that were just, they were feeling really lost and feeling very, you know, kind of isolated. There wasn't a lot of help for women entrepreneurs back then. There wasn't any you know, there wasn't any incubators, there wasn't any of that. And we're kind of talking back in the day, I, I hate to admit how long ago that was. But at the time, less than 1% of venture capital funding was going to women. And we were determined to do something about that. Well, you've made a lot of progress. It's only like two or three <laughs> percent at this point. So still so, still so, oh, work for so everyone. much for everyone. So to be done, so much work still to be done. So well, Denise, in terms of in terms of that, that is just incredible because so many women entrepreneurs today, they still get so much value from being with other women. And it's just because there's not enough um, in terms of the circle and people need those kinds of relationships or people like them that they can ask the questions to and the like. I wanted to ask you about some of the work that you do at Thought Leadership Lab. You've spoken a lot, you've written about, what thought leadership is and actually how anyone can become a thought leader. You've talked about, you know, building your personal brand. I'm wondering if you could comment on those concepts. I think it's such a great definition to, I mean, we really need to begin with this sort of definition of personal branding versus thought leadership. So thank you for this question. I, I think that uh, many people sort of conflate them, but here's an easy way for, that I explain it. That to me, personal branding is bringing people to you for your expertise and bringing attention and people to pay attention to you. Whereas thought leadership, on the other hand, is really about spreading big ideas. It is about really at its maximum, it is about creating a movement around something. And it can be anything from a, you know, a social justice issue, but it could also be trying to gain followers and, and gain 
uh, traction for a big idea around a business process improvement or a new way in which to distribute software. I mean, it can be a lot of different things, but as a thought leader, your goal is how can I get people to pick up my ideas and carry them outwards? So you're not about looking for people to come inwards. You're looking for others to help you carry ideas further and further and further from you. So I think of it as pebble in the pond going out is really what a thought leader is. And that work is something Thing that I don't know about you, but I didn't learn how to do that in, in, in college or business school. You know, how do I get people to pick up my ideas? How do I get people to, to carry forward complexity and build on, on what I know? That, that's the work that I do. Well, in, in terms of that, I think like today, I want to understand sort of the conflation of just like having your own ideas, building a brand, and then just like, you know, how people use social media. I think that, you know, today we've all become familiar with using social media, how to amplify things that we want to say or promote or whatever, but that's not the same thing as being a thought leader, at least as, I, as I've understood some of the things that you've talked about. So maybe you could talk a little bit about good use of social media for building a brand to help you promote your own career and just like, how do you advise women in particular for doing those you know, things differently, but impactfully? For me, it really begins with having an attitude of thought leadership instead of an attitude of look at me, look at me, look at me, right? Right, so right. If we, there's a couple of sort of starting points that I try to encourage people to think about. So if imagine that you are really building either a brand as a expert in your area, or you are really trying to move forward an important change in the world as, a, as an effective change agent. I think that you want to start as an amplifier of the best ideas out there. So thinking to yourself as somebody who, let's pick a particular arena of women's entrepreneurship, like what are the ideas there that need to be spread? So you, you're amplifying those best ideas ideas. Secondly, you're curating, like let's take the best of the best and use your social media, use your following to move forward those ideas. People are not as expert as you are in whatever your particular arena is. So use that expertise to, to highlight the best, curate the best information. That's sort of a second technique. Um, and a third uh, technique is to really look at thought leadership as a way to be a spokesperson for a cause. So not just amplifying others' ideas, but what is your vision of the future? What is your point of view and perspective? So if people can focus in their thought leadership efforts in those three particular arenas, instead of it just being random or it just being, you know, you know, your, what you had for lunch or your, your favorite movie star, like, let's focus on what is my expertise? What should I be amplifying? What do I want to take a stand for? You know, what, what is the curation that I could do to help people find the best information? That to me is a really effective use of social media. How about younger women who are just starting out in their careers who probably at, you know, at the early stages aren't as clear in what they're thinking? They're more sort of like doing work, learning um, on the job, those types of things. How might you advise them to use social media to promote themselves professionally? Probably the most effective way to do this is to be a little restrained. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't, I don't overdo and don't share everything that flits across. You know, if you see something that's exciting and, and fun, you don't have to upvote it. You don't have to like everything. Instead, think about it very much as, you know, sort of looking forward a year. Imagine it's a year from now and you were looking back at what you did, uh, what you did upvote, what you did share what you did comment on, does it tell a story of you as a thoughtful leader? It doesn't mean you have to be brilliant. It doesn't mean you have to have the biggest, best ideas, but being thoughtful, constructing a story with the choices that you make on social media will actually move you forward, even if you are not yet the expert, even if you're not yet. So let's say that you care deeply about a cause or two you know, pick a cause or two, don't pick 23. <laughs> so I think restrained being a little more thoughtful and an understanding that all of the choices we're making on social media tend to follow us for a long time. And so if you can be a little bit more strategic about it, people will look at what you've done and think, oh, oh she does have, she may not be completely a spokesperson about an idea yet, but she has a point of view by the choices she's making. 
Do you think for younger women today, um, professionally being active so on social media, media is an important part of just building your career? I think that the reality is that everyone looks to your LinkedIn profile in almost every career that we have right now. People will look to your LinkedIn profile previous to conversing with you, previous to meeting with you. And so if you are not crafting a story, if you are not careful in what you're saying, if you are not establishing a you know well-written, no edits, you know, no errors. I mean, having it well edited, uh, point of view, perspective, bio, whatever is going to serve you. And so why would you overlook that? Since that is where everybody is looking at you, why would you not want to construct that as well as you construct an outfit for a night out? You know, people spend more time, I find, you know, constructing the perfect outfit to, to go to some social event than they do thinking about what does my LinkedIn look like? That, that that makes no sense to me, right? Yeah, I think it's the, I agree. I think it's the new normal. I mean, you no longer have, you know, just being a private worker, you know, with a, I'm just moving onward and upward if that's what you desire to do. You have a public persona, no matter who you are. And it's something that you really need to uh, take care of. And, you know, professionally, it says something about you. Um, as, and then I think particularly about younger, um, younger women, you know, at the early stages of their career your journey because I'm hoping for all of them to move faster yeah, forward. Get a great uh, picture, a great, great picture for your um, profile and use it everywhere. You know, don't have some haphazard shot where you cut yourself out of a group of friends, you know, that, that has a terrible background. Like really think about this is how people are seeing me. If I care at all about building that reputation, then I should care what I look like on social media. And by the way, take down the pictures. I tried to hire a young woman uh, a year ago and we found some all but naked photos of her on the social media. Like, hmm, okay, might want to take those down. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is how I advise my children when I stalk them on all the um, social platforms that they're on. Um, Denise, I also wanted to ask you about some of the work that you do with uh, corporations. So one of the themes that I've seen in some of your talks is don't fix the women, fix the culture. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that. What do you mean? Why is that important? You know, I spent the first number of my career years in corporate America, and I found it exhausting because it is a place where you do have to fit a particular perspective about what women are supposed to be. I was regularly being labeled as to this or to that, and it was so rare to hear men getting that kind of feedback. And so then I started working as I left, you know, and started my own businesses. I started working with women's leadership programs and women's organizations and realizing how often we are told such you know, just terrible advice about how we are supposed to show up in the world, fake it till you make it and all the rest of the crazy stuff that we're told. <laughs> and, and I just think, you know, it isn't so much about there's something wrong with the women. There is often something wrong with what you are trying to do to women in order to get them to fit some very small point of view you have about what women are supposed to be based on your mom or your, your cousin or your, you know, the teacher you didn't like when you were in fourth grade. And it, instead of imagining that women are as diverse as men are, and we have a lot of different ways in which we show up and we shouldn't have to be some stereotype so that you're happy, right? You know, you should be looking at our skill set and our effectiveness more than whether or not we fit your, anyway. So I could go on about this and I'll let it go for now. But it is, to me, the, the key essential element here that all of these women's leadership programs need to also regularly help the culture change, not just the women change. Well, and then how do you how do you think about that? Because there are, I mean, today, many organizations work on like, you know, whether it's employee resource groups or specific leadership development classes, courses, programs to support women in their organization. How do you square that with, you know, the focus on whether it's the, you know, the, the women's programs with the culture piece that a, that a corporation needs to modify? Is there, are there backlash opportunities? What do you think about about there. The, the challenge 
challenge and opportunity are kind of intertwined here, Lori, right? You have, in, on the one hand, you have a dominant culture, which in many places, maybe not healthcare, but many places that women work in tech and financial services, where they are the minority. And whenever you have a dominant culture and a non-dominant employee, uh, you need some support structures around that. You need to help them to figure out how to advance, how to, how to survive, how to thrive. And that is also true of people of color, you know, that whenever ever is a few versus a lot, you need to find ways in which to support and provide every type of professional development that is available. At the same time, you also need to recognize and, and reward those leaders who are not putting women in a, and people of color in a box, who are not expecting them to be just one way, and in fact are promoting and supporting and developing uh, people who don't look like them. Because for all of us, and I fall into this trap as well, we tend to hire and promote those who we're comfortable with that, that are like us. And that doesn't always translate as people who are women and people who are people of color. Yeah, well, I agree with that. And I mean, I knew the answer to the question personally. I just wanted to hear <laughs> from you, Denise. I mean, this is just great. So you also just, you work on many organizations sort of, you know, that work on women um, empowerment. So whether it's uh, Chief, whether it is uh, Springboard Enterprises, the Forum for Winter Entrepreneurs um, that you founded. Can you just talk about like why these programs are important specifically in terms of helping already pretty accomplished aspiring women, but help them propel them even further. When we founded the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, it was really around that issue of less than 1% of venture funding going to, to women. And that was about three things. We founded the organization to provide education. What is venture capital? How do you structure your company to gain venture capital? What's an exit? All of those things. Second was a community of connections with other women who were also building those kinds of businesses. And third, it was about access to the resource providers, the bankers, the lawyers, the accountants that you need. Needed. I find that those kinds of, if you structure an organization with some sort of a specific set of goals that are actually provable as a way to transform what is broken, then you can move things forward. And similarly, Springboard Enterprises, when I helped start Springboard, which was the first venture capital conference for women entrepreneurs that grew into a, a mighty organization that has had global impact on when we've had 800 and I think it's 850 women who've raised over 10 billion in, in capital over the last 20 years. And that organization similarly was about how can we effectively improve women's access to venture by giving a surround ability of resources and training and access and community that was going to allow women to win in those settings of, of venture conferences and other places where women seek uh, investment. And, and I think Chief, similarly, Chief is all about how can we get more women to the C-suite and keep them there. And again, surround women with a community structure, um, you know, these wonderful peer networks that meet every month. Uh, I run three of these groups now, and there's a peer network of women leaders at uh, se senior levels in their companies. Now they have a chance to kind of let their hair down, share their, uh, their goals and their aspirations, but also the challenges along the way and get advice and counsel and peer, peer coaching from each other, as well as having access to some of the top women speakers who come in to, uh, to provide knowledge and expertise, uh, as well as you know, just lots of other great services. Services. Each of these organizations, you know, sort of in that order, as I've gotten involved with them, has always been about what can we do to, to leverage women's uh, possibilities to open the doors to opportunity and, and really create a level playing field uh, when it isn't. And I think these kinds of organizations are so important. And I just really encourage women to get involved in them. It's, some, it's very important to participate, I think, in the ones that are within your own organization, but being in an external group with other like-minded women is so helpful to just you know build that network of other people who can either support you or provide um, you know, advice in those kinds of just you know really non-work um, related forum. So those, that's just fantastic. Denise, this has been just a rich conversation. I really appreciate all of the information. As we close out here on Inspiring Women, you've worked with women as well as men your entire career, helping to build their professional careers. 
Can you just close out with what is the best advice that you can provide? Particularly, I always think about the younger women who are starting in their professional careers um, to just help them along the way. I love this question. You know, it flashed me right back to this moment in early in my career. I had a mentor, a woman that I always look back so fondly on her, and she gave me a piece of advice that I I still use today. She said, "If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room." And I really want to encourage women to think, are you living on the edge? Are you taking the, you know, the uncommon path? Are you pushing yourself out there and creating a, you know, being a boundary setter and a boundary pusher instead of just taking the normal, you know, whatever falls in your lap, this is your chance that you only get one great career. So why not make it one where you have an impact and where you inspire other women and you have some fun along the way? That is great advice. I love that, Denise. This has been an excellent, inspiring women conversation with Denise Brousseau. And Denise, thank you so much. Thank you. This was a treat. This has been an episode of Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We are produced by Kate Cruz at Executive Podcast Solutions. More episodes can be found on inspiringwomen.show. I am Lori McGraw, and thank you for listening.